Psalm 126, verse number one. Look at your neighbor and tell him, and you're going to be talking. This, go ahead and say this to him. I'm going to be talking to you a little bit today. Say these words with me. It's all coming back. Throw your head back and open your mouth and shout that as loud as you can. It's all, all coming back. Psalm 126, verse 1. When the Lord turned again, the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord has done great things for them. That's us. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. I think I'm going to read that again. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Verse 1 from the NIV reads like this, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. And in verse 4, the New International Version reads like this, Restore our fortunes, Lord, like the streams in the Negev. I'm going to preach for the next three hours and five minutes a message called, It's All Coming Back. Say that one more time. Would you lift your hands, please, real high? Take the bend out of your elbows. Reach for him today. Father, we reach for you today. We don't only need you, we want you. Speak, Lord, your servants are listening. Lord, I break every generational curse in this building in the name of Jesus. I plead your blood over every family, every individual, every single person, every child, every young adult. I plead your blood over this building and over this property. In the name of Jesus, Lord, let oil run through this sanctuary today. Let the anointing pass through this building today. The anointing that breaks yokes. The anointing that sets the oppressed free. Do something supernatural among us today. Help us, Lord, to tap into the supernatural today. Help us to be spiritual in this building today. Father, we have entertained flesh all week, but today we tap into what is spiritual and we say, have your way, God. In the name of Jesus, take us to the next level of living. Take us to the next level of life. Father, we give you praise now that depression is bound in Jesus' name. Oppression is broken in Jesus' name. Any demonic possession is cast out in Jesus' name. Lord, help me to articulate the announcements of heaven over each person and purpose in this building. And I give you praise for the great things that shall transpire over the next few moments of time in the name of Jesus. Now, before we get into the word, let Judah go up out of here. Send a praise up out this building. Come on, y'all. Open up heaven over this sanctuary. That's pretty good. But I'm talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. Before you sit down, high five four people and tell them it's on in the building right now. It's on in the building. God is good. It's on in the building. Psalm 126 was likely written by Ezra when Cyrus defeated Babylon and released the Jews to go build the house of God. We're going to start with that. Cyrus released the people of God to go build the house of God. I'm going to say that one more time. Cyrus released the people of God to go build the house of God. I'm going to say this a few more times in the message today. There is a responsibility to your freedom. Hmm. 
Let that resonate with you today. There is a responsibility to your freedom. God doesn't deliver you from a thing for you to walk ambiguously through life. If God delivers you from anything, it is for something. God is very conspicuous. He is very specific about deliverance. Timing is essential when it comes to deliverance. Long enough is long enough. If Ezra wrote Psalm 126, and I'm confident he did, then Ezra chapter 1 and verse 1 tells us what's going on. The Bible says there that in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord came by the mouth of Jeremiah, and the word must be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of the king who was holding these people prisoner. And he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put this in writing. He said, thus saith the king, Cyrus, the Lord God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has charged me, listen to this, to build a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. So he says this, who is there among you of all the people? His God be with him. Let him go to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. You know why God brought you out of darkness? To be a builder. God brought you out of a life that was filled with destruction to make you anointed in the area of construction. Hmm. So when God speaks through Jeremiah the prophet, Cyrus adheres to the word of the Lord. He lets the people go. And the psalmist states in the first three verses that the working of God to bring a dream to pass is now reality. Verse 4 and 5 of Psalm 20, 126 says, He prays for the complete restoration. Everyone say these two words, This happened. What happened? It turned finally. Or they were free finally. Here's the problem. The problem was they was taken into captivity. The quandary could be summed up in one word. Captivity. Say that word. It means exile or to be carried away. When you are carried away, you are removed from a certain place. You are removed from a mental state or an emotional state. It has to do with transporting you to a new location. Hmm. I thought about this and I thought, so many of us have been carried away, not literally, not physically, but we have been caught up and carried away. Have you ever been carried away with anything? Anybody in the building? My Bible tells me in Hebrews 13, 9, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial foods which is of no benefit to those who do so. Strange doctrine has a way of carrying you away. Yeah. Trying to live by the letter of the law has a way of carrying you away. Being self-righteous has a way of carrying you away. Judging everybody tells me that you have been carried away. When you are always looking for a new revelation, you are being carried away. Not only does the law have the potential to lock you in after you have been carried away, but lawlessness has the same power. 2 Peter 3.17 says, Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, 
Be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless and fall from your secure position. Huh. Carried away by lawlessness, which means you have no boundaries in your life. A person without boundaries and a person without lines, lines is a liability, not an asset. Because they could potentially get involved in things that would be very destructive. Hmm. We all know people who have been carried away by a promiscuous relationship. We all know people who have been carried away by a distraction, carried away by an offense, carried away by a soul tie that you could not break. When you are carried away, when you get carried away, the things that mean the most to you are suddenly jeopardized. And many of you have been carried away by stuff that's unhealthy. Stuff that's unholy, stuff that's ungodly, you have been carried away. The purpose of the enemy carrying you away is to captivate you. It lured you into a place that now you're locked in and you can't find a way out. There are many things lost in captivity. You lose a lot when you are carried away by what God did not tell you to entertain yourself with. Thank God for the prophetic. And we'll say it one more again. Thank God for the prophetic. I remember crossing over into 2019. And I asked the Lord, give me a word for 2019. And the Lord spoke to me and said, this will be a year of finishing. This will be a year of finality. And this will be a year of finally. Finally. Psalm 126 is a fulfilled scripture. Jeremiah says in chapter 29 and verse 10, Ezra said that this word came through him and this was the word. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you. It's almost as if God is saying, I'm going to put you in a place. And you're going to remain there for 70 years because it's going to take you 70 years. To come to a place for you to realize without me, you can do nothing. It's going to take you 70 years for you to wake up and realize I need God more than I need anything else. And they were in this captivity for 70 years. And the prophet said when the 70 years are completed, I will come to you and fulfill my promise. But I'm not going to fulfill the promise until you get to the bottom of yourself. Wow. I'll start studying this. Let me take me a personal pause here just for a moment if you don't mind. I'm supposed to be in Morgan Hill, California today. Preaching to people that I've been preaching to for the last 13 years. They were looking very forward to my visitation and I was looking very forward to visiting them. Something just unsettled in my spirit. 
You're going to learn something about me. I don't move when I'm unsettled. What were you unsettled about, Pastor Rick? Just a lot of stuff. I say, Lord, shall I go? You remember when David prayed that prayer? He said, Lord, shall I pursue them? One time God told him, yeah, pursue them. The next time God said, no, don't pursue them. So I said, Lord, shall I go? And the Lord spoke to me plainly, you shall not go. And this was on Friday. And I said, Lord, why? And he said, because you're going to bring this word to Quest Church and it's going to change the history and the future of these people. And that was very hard for me to accept because I had a wonderful little place I was going to take my wife to in California. <laughs> but I want you to just feel the, the weight of this for a moment. Because I'm not here to preach to you a cute little sermon with three points and a point. I'm not here to give you a lecture. I'm not here to be some great orator. I'm not here to waste your time. I'm here because I think I have brought to you the words of eternal life. And I believe if you'll hear this and receive it, you'll never be the same again. Let's re-engage the word, shall we? So when you look at what is happening here, Jeremiah has prophesied you're going in there for 70 years. And then you're coming out because I know the plans I have for you. Hmm. I read Psalm 137. And I discovered something very interesting. That upon the entrance of this captivity, here's what the people said. By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps in the poplar trees. For there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of those songs of Zion. Listen to the question. How can we sing the songs of the Lord in a foreign land? We knew Zion's tunes. We understand the rhythm and the dynamics of the songs of Zion. But now we are not in the right place to sing those songs. We have wandered into captivity. And we can't even rehearse the tunes that were so readily available to us while we were there. Hmm. Psalm 126 is written at the end of the captivity. Let me state it again for the purpose of context. Psalm 137 was written when they went into captivity. Psalm 126 was written when they came out of captivity. When they came out, they said, we were like them that dream the stuff that dreams are made of. We have been carried away, but now we are being delivered. And it's like a dream come true. We are in the transition period of coming out. And it's like we are dreaming. God turned the captivity. And God told me plainly in prayer to tell you he's turning it like it or not. Hmm. He's turning it, get ready for the turn. God starts speaking to me and said to tell you that the turn is inevitable. Paul wrote to church at Philippi in chapter 1 and verse 19. And he said, for I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. Can I help you this morning? When you have a supply of the spirit of the Lord, there's nothing that can keep you captive that God will not turn. There was, there's nothing that has the power to keep you carried away that God cannot get involved and turn it around. Some of you have been carried away by stuff and you're caught in relationships and things that are unholy and unhealthy. But today, God is about to turn it around. And he says when he turns it, 
it's like a dream. And I thought to myself, what is the result of a dream coming true? And it was right before my eyes. Verse 2 says, then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And whereof we are glad. Circle that word glad. Because when I saw it, the Lord told me and impressed upon me to tell you, you're going to laugh again. You will sing again. You will say, the Lord has been good to me again. And I thought to myself, how important is it to be glad? And I thought, how many visages, how many facial expressions do we see of people that do not look glad? They look either mad or sad, but few look glad. And God is about to put a smile on your face big enough to eat a banana sideways. It is time for you to be glad again. And I came by to ask you, why are you so mad? Why are you so sad? It is time for you to get gladness back in your life. It is time for you to bend over laughing about what God has done in your life. It is time for you to throw your head back and laugh because God has been so good to you. Isaiah 35, 10 says, and those the Lord has rescued will return. Say it with me, we will return. And they will enter into Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be on their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Can I read it again? Gladness and joy will overtake you. You know what I prayed for you today? That God would baptize you in the spirit of gladness and joy. That joy would be so powerful and gladness would be so potent that it would overtake you. Psalm 14 verse 7 says, Oh, that, oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores his people, let Jacob rejoice and let Israel be glad. What is glad? It's having a feeling of satisfaction, a feeling of enjoyment or well-being. It arises from a positive situation or a set of circumstances. God is about to change your set. God is about to show up and do something so spectacular in your life the only expression you're going to have is an expression of joy and gladness. He's about to turn your sorrow to gladness. He's about to turn your mourning to joy. I don't know about y'all, but I'm tired of being around sour people. I'm tired of being around mad people. I'm tired of being around sad people. It's time for us to smile. It's time for us to high-five each other and laugh. It's time for us to say, ain't God so good to us? I'm going to keep preaching till you feel a little of the burden lift up off of you because I came in here to shame the devil and give God glory and tell you, you ought to sit at your dinner table, look at your children, and laugh your butt off because you're so happy about what God is doing in your life. Hmm. Turn again. Now watch this. Watch this. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Verse 4. Turn again. Verse 1. Turn again. What does he say? Verse 1 is the actuality. He turned it again and we came out. But verse 4 is not the actuality. Verse 4 is a prayer. Listen to it. We got out of captivity. Now get the captivity out of us. How many people that do you know that was delivered out of the circumstance, but the circumstance never came out of them? God can deliver an entire congregation out of a situation, but the situation never comes out of them. He can bring you out of Egypt, but until Egypt comes out of you, you ain't going to change. Woo. And the Lord told me today, he is about to bring the captivity out of you. You've already come out of it, but now he's got to get it out of you. And I thought to myself, what does that mean? And here's what I heard. I'm going to bring you out of the mindset of your past. 
I'm going to bring the mindset out of you that was instilled in you from days gone by. It's the behavior patterns you learned when you were in captivity. It's the behavior patterns you learned when you were in that religion. It's the behavior patterns you learned while you were up underneath that controlling spirit. It's the behavior patterns you learned when you walked through a season of people ridiculing you, scrutinizing you. It's coming out today. It, it is a soul tie that the Lord is going to bring up out of you. Everyone say this with me. I have a responsibility to freedom. And your responsibility to freedom is not carrying Egypt into your future. You cannot carry what you learned in your past and expect to live a promised, prophetic, powerful future. You got to change the way you think. You got to change the way you talk. You got to change the way you act. You got to change the way you live. You got to change the way you praise. You got to change the way you worship. You got to change the way you do everything. You can't act like you used to act while you was over there and expect God to do something great while you are over here so I'm calling you today come out come out wherever you are come out come out wherever you are every demonic possession every controlling manipulating spirit come out in the name of Jesus quit acting like a fool when you know you've been blessed quit acting like an idiot when you know you clothed and in your right mind Somebody shout it, come out, come out, wherever you are. And God has delivered this house. And God has delivered this congregation. And it is time for us to change our behavior. I need about 30 sanctified people that will put your hands together and praise him for your deliverance. Tell your neighbor, I can't act like I used to act. I can't do church like I used to do church. I can't carry on like I used to carry on. God has brought me too far to go back to acting like that. Woo. Look at four people and tell them, you're about to get glad. You're about to get glad. Woo. Now, that's my introduction. Can I preach the message now? That's the introduction. I'm about to preach the message now. I'm about to give you the word that the Lord gave me for you because everything is about to turn around. The devil thought he had you. The enemy thought you would never come out of where you were. But I came by to tell you if the devil could have killed you, he would have killed you. But you're still here. You still got your praise on. You still got up this morning. Put your church clothes on and came to the house of God. Why? Because you know your best is yet to come. I need you to shout it as loud as you can. My best is yet to come. Check on me next year. You won't even recognize me. God is changing, transforming. God is pushing me into my prophetic future. I will never be like I used to be. It'll never be how it used to be. I speak to you in the name of Jesus and tell you, come out. Come out of your patterns. Come out of your behavior. Come out of your evil thinking. Come out of your gossiping mouth. Come out of your offended spirit. Come out in the name of Jesus and walk in the blessed land. Walk in the best land. Walk in the anointing. Walk in your assignment. Walk in your purpose. Walk in your power. Walk. Come on, nudge your neighbor and tell him, Pastor Rick's talking to me right now. Now watch this. Woo! Woo! Bless your name, Jesus. I dare you, throw your head back, shout as loud as you can. I'm so glad right now. Now watch this. God told me plainly, impress it on my spirit, and this is why I stayed. There are three things coming back to this house. There ain't no guess. This is absolute. So I said, now Lord, what about the people that are visiting today? 
And he said, if visitors showed up at your house, you wouldn't change the meal because they are there. You would just ask them, do you want some? If you want some, come get some. <laughs> Woo, feel my help coming, Lord. He said three things are going to be restored that are found in this passage of Scripture. Verse 4 says in the NIV, restore our, circle this word, fortunes. The word fortune has several meanings. And I'm going to just give another pause here for my young people. I'm going to tell all y'all on this front row that I could not get y'all out of my mind preparing this word. Young people, listen to Pastor Rick. You have an amazing future in front of you. People who tell you you are our next church, they don't realize you are the church. Let no man despise you because of your youth. So the word fortune has several meanings. Here's two of them. Success and wealth. Restore our fortunes. Restore success to this house. Amen. Proverbs 2, 7. He who holds, he holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield to those whose walk is blameless. He holds success for the upright. I was thinking about success today. And I wrote these words down. Managing success is far more difficult than managing failure. There's tons of material that has been written for people who have experienced failure. <laughs> but what, what has not been written is how to handle success. We told you how to get it. But we didn't tell you how to handle it. Because when you arrive at success, things start finding you. Family members you didn't know you had. People needing a handout. Can you just help a brother? This is why so many successful pastors fail. Because we wasn't worried about them when they had 70 people. But when they had 1,400, we forgot to insulate them with prayer. And we forgot to speak into their ears the secrets of maintaining your success. Accountability. Integrity. So I felt this very strong today that you are about to break the pattern of failure in your life. Yeah. Failure is not an epidemic. <laughs> failure is an opportunity to try again. Yeah. Failure becomes a habit when you become familiar with it. So I speak to you today and tell you, you will not have a lack of faith. You will have a lack of failure. Y'all missed that right there. You will not have a lack of faith. You will have a lack of failure. I didn't say you wouldn't fall. 
but your failures are going to be less than your successes. There's about 20 people in here going to grab that. That's fine. Because some of you are so used to seeing failure, being attached to failure, and failing yourself that you won't try anything else for fear of failure. Fear of failure will keep you trapped in your present circumstance. But when you get enough courage and faith to say, I've been here long enough. I was created to be successful. Young people, you weren't created to fail classes. You weren't created to fail in relationships. You were created to be successful in your classes. You were created to be successful in life, successful in your relationships. Man, I know I'm preaching better than you responding, but I'm going to go ahead and preach anyway. I'm going to say it again. You're not going to have a lack of faith. You're going to have a lack of failures. I bind a failing spirit in Jesus' name. I come against the spirit that keeps people intimidated and keeps them from moving forward because they're afraid they're going to fail. No, you're not going to fail. You're going to step up in the name of Jesus. You're going to the next level. I'm here to tell you, try it one more time. Pray one more time. Implement it one more time and see what God won't do. Fortune means success, and it means wealth. When I say wealth, people duck and dodge because everybody got this mentality that wealthy ain't for us. Let me help you. Wealthy might not be for you. Wealthy is for me. Now, you can have it or not. I don't care if you like being poor broke down, living in poverty, enjoy yourself. You don't have to. You can learn your way out of it. You can pray your way out of it. You can educate yourself out of it. You can change relationships and come out of it. It's all up to you. I ain't living like that. If you think you're going to keep this preacher poor and humble, I'm sorry. I don't need to be poor to stay humble. I had a man tell me, I don't, I don't think a preacher should be rich. God bless you. Psalm 112, verse 1. See now, let me ask you a question. Why is it okay for your doctor to be rich? You ain't said nothing about him. You ain't said a word about your doctor being rich. You ain't said nothing about LeBron being rich. Now, I'm going to help all y'all in here before you start assuming stuff. I'm not rich. I'm just very wealthy. <laughs> you don't know how many books I've written. You don't know how many I sold. You don't know how much money I've saved over the last 36 years. So before you get to jurging, you don't know what I've done with my life. You don't know I have four streams of income and you don't even know what them streams are. So mind, my Bible tells me in Psalm 112 verse one, praise the Lord. Blessed is the man that fears the Lord. That's me. Blessed is the man that gr delights greatly in his commandments. That'd be me. His seed shall be mighty on the earth. That's my grandkids. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. That's me. Wealth and riches shall be in his house. And his righteousness shall endure forever. Wealth and riches shall be where? In his house. Bless the Lord. Deuteronomy 8.18, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Boy, it's getting quiet now. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. 
Is that just for you? No. And he confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is this day. Wealth means enough. Wealth means prosperity with peace. I know a lot of rich people that are miserable. I know a lot of wealthy people that worry all the time. But God says the upright man shall have wealth and it will be peaceful to him. Oh, Lord. So you know what? The Lord showed me wealth is coming back to this house. Wealth is coming from the north, south, east, and west. Let me help you. God don't need your money. He told me plainly his resources are inexhaustible. So before you get the notion you the, 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 are the anointed one with the pocketbook, let me help you. There's a million more people that can't wait to give to the house of God. There's a hundred thousand more people that can't wait to be a blessing. Getting quiet now. You know who's mad right now? The devil and his friends. Somebody say the fortunes are coming back. Success is coming back. Say it as loud as you can. Success. You know what I heard the Lord say? Everything we put our hand to shall prosper. Everything this church attempts shall be successful. Everything this house decides to do, you want to build a private school, then you're going to have the best private school in all of Oklahoma. Why? Because there's an anointing for success in this building. Whew. There's an anointing for wealth in this building. You start calling wealth, wealth starts finding you. How? By being obedient. If you obey, the blessings of God shall overtake you. And can I prophesy to you, the more we do right, the more we live right, the more we're going to have more than enough, and we're never going to have not enough. I don't know about y'all, but I'm ready to live in the land of more than enough. Somebody shot his success is coming back. Wealth is coming back. Then it, can I finish this? Turn again our captivity. I'm supposed to be done right now. Turn again our captivity as the streams in the south. Everyone say the flow is coming back. Woo. I want to thank God for that. Because here's what the Lord spoke to me this morning. I, I woke up at four. I start praying. My wife will tell you that thunder was going off, that lightning. I said, God, I just feel like you walking around heaven stomping your feet. Saying, Ricky, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. And every time that thunder here, I say, yes, God. Yes, God. And God plainly spoke to me and he said, the fight is coming to an end. Fighting with people's opinions, fighting with entitlement, fighting with this attitude, fighting to get this done. This is force, and that is a fight, and this is a war. That's coming to an end. There's about to become a flow in this house where everything becomes easy. The rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth from the house of God. There's a flow that is about to hit this house. And can I tell you what's in this house is about to get in your home. You've been forcing and fighting with your wife and your children. Everything is a grind and everything is forced and everything's a fight. And God told me to tell you the fight is about to be over. You're going to speak it and it's going to come to pass. He sends out his word. He melts the problem. He causes the wind to blow and the waters to flow. If you want want something to flow, you got to get a word. If you want something to flow, you got to get a word. If you want something to flow, you got to get a word. Why? Because the word produces a wind and the wind produces
abundance is a flow. You cannot have a flow if you don't have a word. The word makes the breath of God, the pneuma of God, the spirit of God begin to move in your house. I call for an end of fighting. I call for an end of turmoil. I call for an end of opposition. I call for a flow, an easy flow in your life. It's going to be like rivers of living water. God spoke to me and said there are people in this building that there is something that has caused a dam to stop your flow. And there's going to be dynamite that's going to explode that dam today. Everything you are doing seems to be forced. It's about to be a flow. Anything not flowing becomes stagnant. When it is stagnant, it is unusable. And then the Lord showed me this, and I told you this before, I'm going to tell you one more again. A swimming pool has to have a pump. If you do not have a pump to turn the water over, it becomes stagnant. And algae begins to build up. Then you can't swim in it, you can't do nothing with it. It's an eyesore. When I saw that, I heard this reset button your pump has a reset button and God is about to hit the reset button in your life God is good he that believes on me the scripture said out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water shall flow rivers of living water your pumps broke but today, God is about to touch your life. Now, here's, here's what I saw. Y'all stay right where you are. You good? Watch this. Deuteronomy 11.10. Elder Carey, you're going to like this here. For the land where you go in to possess it is not as the land you came out of. <laughs> Woo. Where you sowed seed and you watered it with your foot. He says, no, the land where you're going, the Lord will give a rain. No more pumping. And I heard these words, learning curve. We usually perceive the sensations that we are programmed to receive. You perceive the sensations you are programmed to receive. I said, Holy Spirit, speak to me. In other words, we are more apt to receive what we more readily recognize. We are more apt to receive from what we more readily recognize. So if so-and-so ain't leading worship, I can't receive. That's not a so-and-so problem, baby. That's a you problem. If so-and-so ain't preaching, I can't receive. I heard Isaiah the prophet say, Behold, I do a new thing. Will you not perceive it? Some of you are so used to the old. New showed up a year and a half ago and you still driving the old car. Oh, I know you ain't gonna clap, but I'm gonna preach it like a T.I. is. New is in this house. You can embrace it or you can get left behind. You can get in the car or stand at the corner, but we ain't going back to what we used to be. We are going forward and your best is yet to come. It's called a learning curve. Reach in the building, Pastor Rick. Bless your name, Jesus. God is about to give you what a, a supply that is suddenly spontaneous. The third thing, and I'm done. Bless your name, Jesus. Number one is what? Fortunes. Number two is what? Flows. Lift your hands, please, and say, Lord, flow in our lives. Flow 
in our church, flow in our families. Now listen to Pastor Rick, quit fighting. Just flow with it. Come, come here, Elder Pat. Come, just stand right here. Okay, I need about 10 guys. Come up here and just stand with me. Come on, real quick. Come on, come on. Watch this. Just face me, Elder Pat. Just get behind me, guys. Just now, here's a guy, not you. I'm not, don't take this personal. This is an example. He refuses to go with the flow. No, okay. <laughs> y'all y'all understand what I'm saying? No, we, I, I'm not. No, it ain't happening like that. So let me show you what happens with the flow. The flow is coming. The flow reaches him. He resists the flow. And guess what happens? The flow goes right around him. And guess what? All of us are way over here, and he's still trying to fight the flow. The best thing for him to do is just get in the flow and quit fighting the flow because when you stop fighting the flow you go to where the river is flowing face the fact that sometimes your opinion does not matter face that get that God's saying this and you are saying no and God don't care God's trying to do this, and you are saying no, and God did not ask you permission. When you get used to fighting all the time, you take it in your house. Then you get irritable with your wife, and everything she does gets on your nerves. And before long, you're like, why you got to eat like that? Why are you sitting like that? Why are you acting like that? Why are you, why are you doing it? And she ain't done nothing. You're just not happy with that. And you're taking that out on her. Oh, I know I'm preaching right. You take what's not working for you out on somebody that's for you. I told my wife the other day, I'm sorry for bringing my stuff that I deal with with crazy people into our marriage. You are better than that. Leave your wife alone, man. She didn't cause that conflict inside. You're just miserable because things ain't like you want them to be. And she's closest to you and you take it out on her. Same thing with friends. Quit taking it out on one friend when all your other friends are jacked up. Yeah, y'all stay there and keep talking to me. Y'all talk to me like that and I'll preach. All right, good. Thank you, brothers. Last thing. Number one is what? Fortunes. Say this with me. Our success is coming back. Put your hand right here and say, I am successful. Now listen to me with your hand there. Quit, quit thinking like a failure. Start living like a champion. Quit expecting to lose. Wake up expecting to win. You are more than a cocker to Christ who gives you strength. You are an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and the word of, and the word of your hey and the word of your testimony. I'm not preaching something false here. I'm telling you the truth. Number one is fortune. Say it again. I am successful. I have wealth because the word says wealth is in the house of the upright. That is Psalm 112. Number two, throw your hands up and say the flow is coming back. Now say this with me, I'm tired of fighting the flow. Now nudge your neighbor and tell them just flow with it, just flow with it. Third thing is future, future. Psalm 126 verse five says this, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seeds, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. When I studied this, everyone's standing. The reason this person is weeping 
is because they don't have as much seed as they want. When it says, he that goeth forth bearing precious seed, it's an amount of seed. And because he's got so little, Butch, is so precious to him. So he has to decide. I'm at the end of my rope with all of this. Do I want to sow? The little I have left. The little energy I have left of this. Do I want to sow it or keep it? And he's crying about it because he's tore up. He's caught between sowing and and hold it. So he rejoices because the harvest was tremendous over a little bit of seed. Your future is not in what you do not have. Your future is in what you do have. Stop being mad about what you don't and start rejoicing over the little bit you do have. Little lady, how much do you have? Two mites. Little lad, what do you have? A few fish and a few loaves of bread. All he asks you for is what you have. He's never asked you for what you do not have. That's why it is impossible for God to pressure you. It's out of his reach to pressure you because he only wants what you have. Remember, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Fortune means one's future lot. Restore what the enemy has destroyed that would build our future. Did y'all hear that? Restore what the enemy has destroyed that would build our future. That's strong. Woo. I don't know what this says to you, but it tells me, as I said earlier, I can't talk my way into a lot of stuff, but I can sure pray my way into it. Yeah. Pray one more time. Worship one more time. God's not asking you for what you do not have. He's asking you for what you have. So I prophesy to every family in this church, God is restoring your fortune. Wealth and success is coming back to your house. Hallelujah. Can anyone receive that? Come on, even though you don't recognize it, can you receive it? I'm going to say it again. Success and wealth are coming back to your, your fort. Success and wealth, no more failure. You're not a failure. Jesus said, I prayed for you that your faith fail not. No more failure. No more failure. No more failure in the name of Jesus. Your fortune is coming back. The flow is coming back. You know what I hear the Lord saying? My yoke is easy and my burden is light. I hear God speaking to me right now to tell you, get ready, because stuff is about to become easy. Woo! Stuff is about to become easy for you. You're going to try it, it's going to be easy. You're going to attempt it, it's going to be easy. There's a flow coming and the fight is leaving. And finally, get ready for a bright future. Quit looking into your tomorrows and crying about what might happen. No, start laughing and rejoicing about what will happen because your future is so bright that the devil can't do nothing about it. Your future is intact. Woo. Someone say this with me. I can see myself in my future and I look a lot better than I look right now. Say it again, I see myself in my future and I look a lot better than I look right now because everything I have, I'm going to sow it. I'm going to sow my energy. I'm going to sow my time. I'm going to sow my purpose. I'm going to sow everything I've got into the soil of God's kingdom. And my future is bright. 
I need a church to give God a crazy praise in this building. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, tell somebody your future's so bright you need to put some sunglasses on. Tell them your future's so bright you need to wear sunglasses. You know what? I feel the devil fighting this word. He fighting it tooth and toenail. The devil is a liar. If there are people in this building that can receive the word that came from this pulpit today, I want you to give Jesus Christ a crazy praise. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, you're free to worship. You're free to praise. You're free to sow. You're free to dance. You're free to rejoice. You're free to be glad. Hallelujah. 